Let's begin. So focus and balance. If you're going to walk a tightrope, you're going to need to do that. And I selected this picture on purpose because I think it describes a lot of what we're going through. If you're going to walk a tightrope, I don't think doing it in heels is probably the way to do it. I don't know how women walk in heels anyway, but to do it on tight rock, it seems like... So we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 as we begin. And I want to kind of pull back just a little bit. We're going to talk about some things going on prophetically, but I want to, I want to encourage all of us <clears throat> to know how to walk this tightrope that we're walking. And the Word of God gives us the answer and the solution, and we're going to talk about that. So we begin in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble. Paul's suffering trouble because of the gospel. As an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is of Christ Jesus with eternal glory. <clears throat> it is a faithful saying, If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, Paul says to Timothy, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. I think that last really describes a lot of the things that, you know, we talk on Facebook a lot about masks and vaccines and and it all probably goes nowhere and doesn't mean anything much. And Paul gives them encouragement here to talk about those things that will profit. So let's look at all of that. And the value of a balanced walk on a tension rope of prophecy. That's our subject matter tonight. The tension, of course, is between two fixed points. That's where that rope is attached. Two things. Number one... Where we are right now, that which is. And we are, and so persecution came upon Paul. Paul's talking about that. He's being persecuted for being a Christian. And it says he's being persecuted as if he did something evil, and he didn't. So persecution has rose and fallen over the years. It, and this world, and especially in America, but the whole world... Christianity was the favored religion 30 years ago. It's not now. We have cycled into a period of persecution. I believe the last period of persecution. And what we've got going on in America right now is a soft persecution. Nobody's really suffering very hard, but we have indicators that it's going to get rough. But then there's the tension, these two fixed points, that which is right now, but we're walking towards something. This is what prophecy is all about, it's telling us where things are headed. So the value of that. There's the old saying, somebody who is so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. The truth is, without a heavenly perspective, without an anticipation of the rapture, without the anticipation of Christ coming and all that will proceed and go along with that, the believer is not going to be any good to the kingdom. If you don't have the biblical perspective that prophecy gives you, you're not going to be any good to the kingdom. Right. Amen. So we really need this that we've been talking about. I believe... And I've had some comments from some of you that it has encouraged you uh, and enlightened you and opened your mind to some things uh, and put them in perspective about what we're going through. So let's talk about a couple of details going on in the world before we get to an in-depth study. Uh, 
the Bible indicates that there's going to be increase in violent events. There's a lot said about that. Paul, uh, Jesus specifically gave his disciples in the private briefing, he said there would be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Amen. Right? Now, the end is not yet, but those things will build. They will increase. That's Jesus' point. They will increase right at the end. So, I thought I'd look at this headline that you might be interested in. This is in the Telegraph. That's English, uh, England. Natural disasters are increasing, but they are not killing people as often. Okay, and so they go into uh, the detail. The, the United Nations is where this information comes from. The United Nations Weather Outfit has studied this, and they've found the number of floods and droughts increased fivefold since the 1970s. But deaths dropped over the same period. Uh, there were 700, I don't know whether I can make that bigger, 711 reported disasters between 70 and 79, compared to 3165 between 2010 and 2019. A slight drop on the 35-36 reported during the period between, so that's a lot of numbers, a lot of figures, uh, just making it more complicated. So the good news is we are surviving better when these things happen. We've got uh, ambulances and hospitals and all the things of modern era. That's a good thing. It's, it's good to live in the civilized modern era. So there are, but my point is, there are more of these natural disasters going on, they say. It is increasing fivefold. Okay, this is the United Nations. Why would they be telling us this? A couple of reasons. One, maybe statistically this is accurate. Two... They want to get into your pocket and take your money for global warming, Amen. climate change, or whatever the current name that they're using. So we're not naive here at all. The statistics are there. I think that fivefold more things. That, that's my point. What Jesus said, I think we're coming to. Now, their motive for reporting it, they're going to emphasize what they want to do to get money from us. So we have talked about two approaching wars, the Psalm 83 and the Ezekiel 38 wars. We talked in great detail about that. I'm not going to go all over it. But these two wars are out in our future. We know Ezekiel 38 is right at the end of the tribulation time. So the tribulation is precisely, Daniel declared it very precisely, it is seven years long. Jesus made it very clear that it is three and a half years into that that begins the great tribulation. Amen. Okay, so we've got seven years. Once that clock starts running, halfway through it, all those things, the Antichrist is going to set up his image in the temple and make everybody bow down and worship and all that. But there's these two wars. We know the timing pretty much of Ezekiel 38. It's at the end of the seven years. But the Psalm 83 war could happen at any time, even before the, the tribulation time begins. So here is a map, and remember when we talked about it, the Psalm 83 war that we think is probably going to happen sooner, it certainly can't happen later than Ezekiel 38, so it has to happen somewhere earlier in the tribulation or even before the tribulation begins. It is a closer in circle of enemies against Israel and the Ezekiel 38 war is a larger group of people we'll look at that map in a moment but notice this map kind of describes the players right immediately around Israel now I bring all this up because of this Trump is no longer president could I get an awe Trump is no longer president Whatever your political persuasion, 
He was the anti-globalist, and he made deals, and the, the little me- Middle East was coming together in some astounding ways that I would never have thought possible. With his election out of the way now, it's reverted even worse. These nations know they can't depend upon Israel like they were beginning to. No, they can't depend upon the United States the way they were depending. So these nations are now going to coalesce more against Israel than ever before. Mark my word. That's what's coming. The other war in Ezekiel 38 at the end of the tribulation is not the closer in circle of enemies, but it's the farther out circle of enemies. And here's Here's a map of that area. And, and so all of these areas around here are the areas that it says is Gog and Magog and Mishael and Tubal, Meshach. There's, there's players that we kind of know who they are. And they're a bigger ring farther out, including Russia, but others as well, including Iran. And so we've got I Afghanistan right over here. It's not specifically mentioned, so far as I can tell, in the group of people who will be in this Ezekiel 38 war. But I believe it will be a player, and this is just conjecture on my part, based on how this is all playing out. What was Afghanistan before America got involved in a war there? It was where Al-Qaeda had their training camps. You remember the pictures we saw on TV of the, the guys training in the white suits remember that that's coming back probably tenfold who's going to stop them this is going to become a training camp for stuff that is coming now i don't know to predict all the stuff that is coming but that's that's going to be a and it it really fits in with the end time period of lawlessness right that's going to be a lawless time and those people are going to do what they want. And they'll be, Putin, whatever else is true about Putin, he's smart. Smarter than any president we've got right now. He's smart. Putin was asked a week ago, are you making any plans to go in and fix the problem in Afghanistan? Putin responded simply with genius response, we learned our lesson. I think they're going to go back in, but not as warriors. I think they're going to go back in. You know, everything in the end is ultimately about the money. China's going in for the money. Russia's going to go in for the money. Uh, They don't care how many heads they cut off. What does Putin care about that? He don't care. So things are shaping up. Now, as I have also told you before, things play out longer and take longer than you think. So the end is not tomorrow. It's probably not next month. Could be. All these things could really coalesce in a huge way if you remove every believer out of the world. The rapture, right? I mean, that will accelerate things beyond what we can even comprehend. So my point is, until that happens, this is going to take longer to play out than maybe what you're afraid of. You may be afraid that... You know, next month it's all done. Now, this is a thing that's going to take several years to play out. We could be 10, 20 years away from the rapture. So, pace yourself. (laughs) Okay. Why should we walk this tightrope of where we are to where we're going? Why should we bother even doing that? That's what Paul addresses there in 2 Timothy 2 that we looked at. So I'm going to look at this in a bit of detail, and I hope it encourages you. Motivation number one, there are rewards that lie ahead. We're told in verse 8 and 11 that there's a resurrection coming. Jesus was the first fruits in verse 8, but we're going to follow. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus was the first fruits. On the feast of first fruits, right? That's the way God does stuff. He makes that prophecy. 
Every year they rehearse that first fruits, and then on that first fruits, when Messiah has come, he comes forth from the grave. Only God could do a thing like that. And then the rest of us in our due time. I don't know when our due time will be, but it's all covered. If I die tomorrow, I'm going to go to heaven, and I will get in on that resurrection when that resurrection day comes. And that resurrection day will simply mean that my physical body is going to be joined back with who I am. Right? So we're, there's, there's no sleeping in the grave, as some false religions teach. The moment you die, you're instantly taken to heaven if you're a believer. And you will be there with a presence I don't know what. I don't need to know what. It's going to be good enough until that day of the resurrection comes... When my body, and by the way, that body, near as we can tell, the only indications we have are when we see him, we shall be like him. I'm going to have a 33 and a half year old body. Amen. And I'm telling you, when I was 33 and a half, I was something to look at. <laughs> I don't know what happened. No. Something happened. But I'm going to get that resurrected body. And that's a real reward. That's a real motivation for us walking that tightrope of the persecution that we're living with now and whatever is ahead until we get to the other side. But not only resurrection. In verse 12, he talked about us reigning with him. In verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. I want you to think about that for a moment. I don't know how good I will be at people bowing down and worshiping me as a reigning king. I'm sure it's probably not going to play out that way. But we are going to rule this world with him. It says that over and over in scripture. It says it many different times. We see it in Revelation. We see it in the prophecies. We see it uh, in the Old Testament prophecies. We see it uh, in the things the New Testament writers said. We're going to reign and rule with Christ. And that, of course, is the millennial rule. But that's a real reward. We're going to get that one of these days. Motivation number two. It all lies ahead. Now, I know that's just a genius concept that you probably never thought of. <laughs> it can't lie behind. It, it's all going to have to be ahead. But I want you to think about it. That's the way God made existence. You've heard me say it before. God can be found in that next moment that you're going to. Amen. Go right there. That's the design of time. And that's a really good thing. Backing up is not an option. Verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble, Paul said, as if I did something wrong. Even to the place where I've been put in bonds. But the word of God is not bound. So the God of the next moment, or if I could coin a phrase, the God who is I am. <laughs> Actually, I didn't coin that, did I? Jesus and God said that. God said it to Moses. and Jesus said it seven different times in, in uh, John. I am, among other things, the resurrection and the life. So... Paul says, I'm suffering as an evildoer and I'm in bounds, I'm, I'm being bound. But the word of God is not. Evidently, people were being saved, even as Paul was in bonds. So backing up is not an option. Now, I guess I'm saying that because some people seem to live in the yesterday. That church that they used to belong to, that was the heyday. That time back when I was younger and could really serve the Lord with fervor and energy and no problem, that was the heyday. Okay, maybe so, but that's not the way God designs things. You're here now, and you're moving to the next moment, and that's where you're going to find God. Amen. That's what He's up to right now. I hope that's an encouragement to you. Backing up, though, huh, that's not an option. You can live in the past, but that's not reality. You're not really doing much living if you're doing that. 
God's kingdom moves forward. Verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So the kingdom is moving forward. Stop wasting your time on stuff that doesn't matter. Now, I say that as somebody who wastes time on things that don't matter sometimes. Uh, I have been chastised by some fellow pastors about posts that I put on Facebook about vaccines and face masks. But I've reminded those guys, and they have to agree with me, that vaccines and face masks, while they're not the mark of the beast, that's where it's headed incrementally that's where it's headed Amen. all of the state of wisconsin i believe it was michelle bachman uh, was just recently saying uh, all of the state workers in wisconsin i think it was are required to get the vaccine now i'm not i'm not making a statement about whether you ought to get the vaccine or not i'm not talking about that i'm talking about the government telling you you have to get it yeah. i'm going to go back to what the pro-abortion people have always said, my body, my life. If I take the vaccine, that's my choice. That's not my president's choice. Amen. And by the way, you're going to have to get a vaccine booster every week now. Did you hear that? <laughs> well, that might be a bit of overstatement. But that's where it's going. Pretty soon we're going to have to have it mainlined. We're going to have to get it every day. They don't want to waste all that vaccine. They got to do something with it. Yeah. And and I I have to say this. And there there are some national doctors who are actually starting to say something about this. It's starting to drive them crazy. Some well-respected doctors. That they're not talking about natural immunity. Israel, in Israel... And I don't know whether you get two cards that are separate or it's one card with a designation. You can either have the vaccine or you can have the natural immunity having had COVID-19. They're equal. You hear nothing about that in America for the most part. There's no money in natural immunity. (laughs) Okay. Motivation number three. The impact of what we're all about as a church. The Great Commission. What we've been called to do. It's in verse 10. There it is on the screen. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Paul's talking about the elect who have not been saved yet. He's saying, I endure this so that people can be saved. So, how far would you go for somebody to be saved? What would I be willing to do for somebody to be saved? If you knew that it would cause someone to be saved, that you were willing to take a stand for Christ and be thrown in jail, and and, and maybe never get out, would it be worth a soul that would be saved if you spent the rest of your life in jail? Absolutely. Now, you say that, and I agree, that won't be so easy to say when they bring the shackles. That won't be so easy to say when they actually do it. But when you go back to what Jesus said, he said, for those that are going to be going to hell will suffer uh, uh, in the lake of fire. And, and, uh, you know, when you read about that, whoever will want anybody or, you know, if you could do anything to change somebody's somebody's destination, why wouldn't you do it? Agreed. It's going to cause you suffering. But, I know, it's painful. In our society, where it's all about me. Our society is so pre-programmed to avoid pain, to avoid, you know, I I think there should be a law. I I would like to have a national law, a federal law, that applies to any business, anywhere, if anybody utters the words, I take full responsibility for my actions. The very next thing that happens, it should be the law. Right after they say that, they lose their position, whatever that is. Because that's what it means to take responsibility. Otherwise, it's just empty words. It doesn't mean anything. 
<laughs> yeah, because just nobody's going to call them on it. Yeah. Okay, so what we have been called to, if we think about what they're going to suffer in hell, Paul says, I'm willing to do that for the elect's sake, that they might be able to be saved. Life is hard, and spiritual life is work. I am so grateful for those who went visiting, who were able, some of you I know were not able to go visiting uh, physically. For those who were able to go, that we went out Sunday night and then the next Saturday, uh, I am so grateful. And I told them, but I had to remind myself, it's going to be hot. You're going to have to carry stuff. You're going to have to go back and forth shuttling to the car. It's, it's going to be work. It's, I can't change the laws of physics. Right? It's not about how easy it was. It's about how important it was. Amen. Exactly. So life is hard. Spiritual life is work. Yes. Um, and I, as I think on these things, it's easy for me to say here and now, oh, I would never deny Christ. But when you, you're out there in your home, they come there and they say, either you deny Christ or we chop your grandson's head off. Exactly. And in fact, if you look at the martyrs of the past, some of them in the last moment gave in. And I'm sure they went to heaven. I'm sure they were saved. Okay? I'm just saying, when they put the bamboo shoots under your fingernail, yeah. it's going to make a difference. Yeah. Now, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, in that day, I'll give you the words to say. That's I'm our sure, comfort. I'm sure glad for one saved, always saved. Yeah. He will give us the strength and the words in that moment. But I'm just, I'm just saying, and this is, I'm, I'm putting it to you, life is hard, and spiritual life is work. Amen. And then it is a matter of life and death, as we have been talking. Those people, hell is going to be a very bad thing. And it is worth it for them that we, like Paul, make a commitment that when we get to that moment, we will do what we need to do whatever he empowers us to do. Okay, so what's the value in being joyful during persecution? Okay, so we've talked about the persecution that's coming. We've talked about walking that tightrope. Why should we do it? The motivation. What's the value in us having joy during this persecution? One will not continue the task, our mission, under increasingly hard circumstances and persecution without that joy. I believe that's why Jesus bequeathed it to us, that in that moment we will be able to have joy. When it doesn't make any sense to have joy, when it's contraindicated to have joy, and yet something in us, that motivation of the things that are coming, those rewards that we're going to be getting and the people who are going to be saved because we're willing to save. All of those things, when we think on them, will bring us joy. Hardships manifest what is under the surface, right? So you take metal and you want to find out what that metal is made of. You stress that metal or that concrete or whatever it might be. In engineering, you have ways of testing that kind of thing. You find out what it's made of, and they come up with very intricate standards for how concrete needs to be poured, what needs to be in that concrete to be strong enough for a bridge or for a sidewalk, and they're not the same, right? And so that's because they've been tested. And so the testing will show what we're made of. What are we made of? I suggest that it's time for the sleeper cells to activate. Amen. Now we think about Russia or Al-Qaeda having sleeper cells among us. I want to suggest to you that there's actually scripture that indicates there are sleeper cells in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. You probably never knew that. Here it is. Romans 13, 11. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Amen. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness 
and let us put on the armor of light. Isn't that a great way to think about ourselves? We are the sleeper cells. It's time for us to activate. Which means, of course, we don't blow up things. We tell about Jesus. Amen. It'll be interesting to see if anybody of all the visiting that we did, of all the pieces that we passed out, of all the goodwill or bad will that we garnered out there, if we'll ever know it did any good for the kingdom. Yeah. One thing is certain, we will have gone out faithful. Yes. We will have done what we were told to do. Okay, so let's close this time, and we will then discuss all that you want to. Yes. Go ahead. Um, 